chapter. There came to Jesus some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him the question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and, di and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but to those who are accounted worthy to obtain to, the age, to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and heavenly Father, uh, we give you thanks so much that you have called sinners, sinners to repentance here, that you have called us here not by our own power, but by the power of your Spirit. Father, we will need that same spirit now as we listen to your word. We will need that same spirit as we come to your meal. Empower us by your spirit, that this word might bring life to us, that it might be accepted into our hearts for the powerful seed of life that it is. And then by the strength of your strong spirit, give us strength to do your will in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So anybody else want to come up here and give this one a try? I mean, this is, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to tease you past, I really did, I'm so sorry, I forgot who I was preaching to, but uh, uh, he just, he, he gets the children's sermon this weekend, he gives me the gifts, uh, but really some tough lessons, I mean, really, they taught us in homiletics class, in preaching class, uh, that I just finished up a, a semester or two ago, you got to answer the tough questions. The one thing we can't do is just sweep it under the rug. These are some tough questions. Uh, they taught us to, to ask the tough questions about the text because, honestly, if they're going on in my fallen mind, the chances are they're going on in your, your mind as well. What questions come up for you when you, you hear that gospel lesson? Jesus is being tested, uh, ultimately, about what it means that the dead are raised. That, that's the test. The, the Sadducees are, are questioning him. Right before that, the Pharisees are questioning him about different things. It's about the resurrection. And the Sadducees are actually making a mockery of two things. Making a mockery of marriage and a mockery of the resurrection. But regardless of that, if you read Jesus' response, anybody here married? Does that bother anybody? I was married for 15 years. That's bothered me. Now that I'm divorced, it still bothers me. It really does. What do you make out of a text like, what is Jesus saying about marriage here on earth? What's he saying? What's the connection between this age and the age to come? It's a tough question. You've got to answer that one some, somewhere. Uh, it raises the question, what is the purpose of, of earthly marriage? Are we missing something here on earth that's not in heaven? Why would, I, why would we not be married to our husbands and wives in, in heaven? What is that purpose of marriage? Could it be that it is to pass something on? Something more than just the family name. Something more than, than just passing on the genetic code to the next generation. Maybe, there, maybe there's something that's in the resurrection that, that, that is to be reflected in, in our marriages here. Could it be that, that what we're doing here is passing on the faith? Now, there's a perspective. Passing on, not just passing on the faith. Yes, that's what we're doing in a marriage to our spouse. And if we happen to have children, we're, we're called to pass that faith on to them. But 
But when we pass on that faith, we pass on something else. Not just religion. That's not what's being passed on as religion. It's the faith. And with that faith, that faith in the risen Lord Jesus, passing on that faith passes on not just this life, but a relationship with God that is eternal. The purpose of marriage, to pass on that faith, to pass on to your spouse, to pass on to your children, that relationship with God. That's the ultimate thing. Not the religion, but that relationship with God. That God that sent Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Because the ultimate relationship that any of us could ever have is with God through Jesus Christ. But there's a problem with marriages these days. Is that we're, we're sinners. We're, we're, two, we're two sinners that come together. And so you, you, know, you can get taught. It's two negatives that come together. You know the, the like poles of a magnet? Two negative poles of a magnet? You bring them together. What, what do they do? Repel each other. What's going to hold two sinners together? Except that there's a relationship with the only one who can hold them. To, to the one who created marriage in the first place. That's the problem uh, when we leave God out of, out of a marriage. It's not if the challenges will arise. It's, it's when they will. They're going to come either way. But if God is not at the center of one or both of, of, of that person's lives, uh, the challenges are going to often be more than we can overcome. That's a truth and a reality. So it, we, we ask that... When, I, I've been blessed to do one, pre, one set of premarital counseling um, but as Pastor Johnson was, was training me to do this, uh, it really made a lot of sense. It, it, it's, a trick, it's a true and false question, but it, it's designed to be a trick question, but it really makes you think about the relationship of God in our lives. So, true or false? Marriage is a 50-50 proposition. You're not allowed to look at him as he's shaking his head. No, it's not. If it's a 50-50 proposition, husband and wife... The question is, Wigiot, where is God and all that? If it's 50, it's just between two sinners. There's no relationship with God. God has no room in that relationship. And yes, those challenges will come. Many times, un unsurmountable challenges will come. Marriages end in this life. I'm not just talking about divorce. I mean, we're sinners. We are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. So by divorce or by death, we, we have limited marriages in this life. That's a, a reality. And if God is not somewhere within that, when those losses happen, that takes an awful toll on a heart. It really does. As I met with, uh, we had somebody uh, request the grief support meetings again this, this year. Uh, I was very blessed to do it last year, even more blessed to do it this year. But as we... As we gathered, it's, it's a small little group, but as we gathered, and there's some there from last year, uh, two years gone, their spouses. Uh, others there that had just lost their spouse. Others there in, a, you know, in all kinds of relationships trying to figure out where God is at in all this. So if, if our identity is only fully in our spouse, if our identity is only fully in another sinner, if... if the meaning in life is, is only held in, in another person of a fallen humanity. Those challenges are going to be insurmountable when these losses come. But when? We remember that that relationship with God is there. That he is seeking us out in Christ. When we remember that our identity is not in ourselves, it's not totally in our spouses, but it is in Christ where that relationship with God comes. And it's that relationship with God through Christ, that, that Christ that, that rose again, that Christ who is resurrected. What if that were the ultimate reality? And they're in the midst of death, and there might be hope. Only through that relationship with God is there that kind of hope when you lose the loved one, when you lose the relationship that you never thought would end, only in that identity, only in that relationship with God, who not that we loved him first, but that he first loved us through Christ, only there is there hope. There's a hope of, 
of another life, a, a new life that we are called to. Not solely based in another person, but ultimately based in our relationship with God through Jesus. Because the ultimate relationship that we could ever have is with God through Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate relationship that we could ever have. And what that means is that He comes first. He is life, and our connection to Him is through Jesus. That Jesus that is the risen Lord. But um, you know, if we think of that from our fallen perspective, that it's only between us and God, um, it, it, that sounds limiting, doesn't it? If it's just between us and God, it sounds exclusive. If it's him and him only, actually, no. It's not him only, it's him first. There's difference. Our relationship with God is exclusive only in that he comes first. But it's inclusive, meaning that the context for the rest of our relationships means that he does come first. That shapes the context of the rest of our relationships, of our marriages, of our co-workers, of our families. We are baptized into Christ. And yes, baptized into his death. But not only his death, we are baptized into the risen Lord Jesus so that we might have that relationship with God. That relationship with God that is not our only relationship, but it's the first relationship. It's the relationship that gives us life. Life that surpasses this one that's passing away. Yes, the ultimate relationship we can have is through God, is with God through Jesus Christ. So I reflected a little bit about some of the jobs that we put first in our lives. Husband, wife, vicar, pastor, disciple. Is it a husband's job First and foremost, to be a husband. No, it is the husband's first and foremost job as a disciple of Christ to seek ye first the kingdom of God. Is it a wife's first job to be a wife? No, it is her, her duty to, be, to seek ye first the kingdom of God. Is it my first duty to be vicar? No, it is my first duty to seek ye first the kingdom of God. Is, will it be my job someday as pastor to be a pastor or will it be to seek ye first the kingdom of God? as a disciple of Christ, as his disciple, as a disciple of the one who came to inaugurate the kingdom here on earth. We seek his kingdom first. And then, that, that first thing, and then everything else will be added unto you. The relationships that you thought could be impossible, when he is first, there, there's a way to, have to make it work. Yes, the ultimate relationship that we can have is with God, and that is through Jesus Christ. So as we reflect on this example of Jesus, that he came first to do the Father's will. God's will came first to Jesus, but you know what? Fulfilling that will first included all of us. The entire forgiveness of all of your sins. Because Jesus put the will of the Father first, that included us all. Exclusive that he's first, inclusive that it shapes all of our relationships. So as we reflect on this gospel lesson, the, the, Jesus is talking about this age and the age to come. About this age that is passing away. And about the resurrected life. That life that we will live fully in him. When, when, we are, when God is present with us, it, it, it brings to mind, it, you know, we know what it's like to live in this age. Have you ever been asked the question, what's, what's heaven like? Anybody ever ask you that question? Yeah. Way back when, uh, one of Lisa's friends asked me, uh, she, she saw that I was in seminary, thought I knew everything. Ha! I can't believe that. But she asked me the question, uh, what's heaven like? What do you know about that? Well, I, honestly, I don't know much about it. Be truthful with you. But I know a lot about the sinner that I am. So as I reflect, you know, when someone asks you a question like that, you're kind of on the spot. You, you, can't, you can't fluff it under the rug. So I, I remembered that I was a sinner. And that that sinner, that sin separates me from God. So that maybe somehow heaven is where sin doesn't exist. Maybe somehow heaven is where there's no division. 
if you would, um, as, as I answered that question uh, to, to my friend back then, I, I, I had this picture in my head, and I, I wanted to share it with you. If you want to close your eyes and come along, you can. Um, I, I see this room. Um, it's huge. It, it, it has no end to it. Um, there's, there's like smoke on the floor. I know maybe there's some dry ice there or something. I'm not really sure. But, and there's a bunch of people there. There's my family, my mom and my dad, my sister. There's my friends through grade school, high school, college. They're all there. And really, I just didn't see it till now. They're at a big table. They're there. The smoke is around. And also at the table are the patients that I've treated as a physical therapist. Even the ones I didn't like. Even the ones that made my job hard. They were there. I also saw other people, maybe just people in past, people that I had sinned against, people that had sinned against me. And as I look around even further, I look even closer, this picture of heaven is, there's my enemies that repented. So there they all were, ones for whom Christ had died. But there's a funny thing about it, as I, as, as I look at all these people, people that I had sinned against, people that sinned here, there, there, was, there was a different perspective. Because as I look up to the right, way up high to the right, as I look, there's this light coming down from this throne, and this light is shining on all the people. And, and I, can't, I, I can't see those that sinned against, I can't feel the sin, I can't feel the anger, I, I can't feel the resentment, and nor do they feel it, it's just not there. You can open your eyes now if you want. Heaven will be there. There is no. There is no separation. There is no division. There is no fear. No disease. No hurt. There's safety. There's protection. There's assurance that comes from the light from the throne. That that, that throne that that the Lamb sits on. His light is shining. There's no sun. No moon. God himself is with his people. He is their light. He is their son. He, in that vein, he's the basis of my relationship with everybody else. Him and him first. So why is there no marriage in heaven? If that marriage is meant to pass on the relationship of God to one another, to your children, then in the resurrection, that's fulfilled. Marriage isn't taken away. It's added to that love of God that surpasses all human understanding, that will be our basis for our relationship with everybody. The sin that binds us to the anger, the resentment, it's gone. It's been cast away. The tears have been wiped from their eyes, from my eyes, from their eyes. That was my vision, but the book of Revelation says it a little bit better. You can't get, you can't get much better than the word. Revelation chapter 7. As John seeing the vision, uh, then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and whence have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said, and he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they before the throne of God, therefore, therefore, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night within his temple. And he who sits upon the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Sun not sh shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And then he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. A pretty good picture of perfect relationship with God. That one that Christ came to inaugurate here in this age and will be reality in the age to come. That's the heaven that we wait for. A heaven that's free of sin. A heaven that's free of bondage. Because then that ultimate relationship of, with God will be through Christ Jesus in, real, in the real and present time when he comes again. So he is the Lord of the living and not the dead. 
And did, you, did you notice how I read the gospel lesson? Did you notice that last line? I said something just a little bit different. It's an open book test. You can go back to the, the last line of, oh, sorry, that gospel reading. It says in the English here, for all live to him. But you can arguably say when you look at it in the Greek that all live through him. Yeah. We live through him. Though we are dead in sin, we are alive to Christ. I think Paul had something to say about that. In Romans chapter 6, he says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can one who has died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that Christ, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed. We might no longer be enslaved to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. That's the meal. For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But for the life he lives, lives he lives it to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. He is the God of the living and not the dead. We remembered in our baptism, or we should have remembered in our baptism this morning, that we are dead to that sin and alive to Christ. So that, yes, through him, through that cross on our floor, through that holy baptism, through this holy meal, through him, all are alive. That's quite a statement, that all are alive. That's quite a statement for Mildred White. Mildred was 91 years old, laid her to rest yesterday. God rest her soul. But that's the thing is that she rests. He didn't die, she's resting from her labors, from her labors that were done through faith in Jesus Christ. She didn't just pass on religion to her children. She passed on the faith. She didn't just pass on the faith, she passed on a relationship with God relationship that is eternal. So in marriage, in life, and as disciples, we live in relationship to God, and we live through him, by his means, by his life, by his meal, through no power of our own. We serve in much the same way we live. We serve through him, by his means, his life, and his meal. Strengthened by that word and by that meal, we go in peace and we serve the risen Lord, that risen Lord Jesus. We go to Peru next week, share that light and that love with people that would not know it otherwise. It's amazing. You know, I've been privileged to sit in on a couple of the Skype sessions uh, over the last several weeks, and I have no idea how we've done what we've done in that place. But we saw the need the need uh, that was there for ones for whom Christ had died. And, and we figured out we had a few resources, so it wasn't a matter of if we could do it, it's, it's how or when we would do it. That was empowered by the risen Lord Jesus. It wasn't our plan, it was his. And that came about because he wanted a relationship with us. And not just those that go to Peru, but in your life and in mine, each and every day as we're here, that life is lived through him dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Alive in the world in our words and our deeds. Oh, my buzzer on my hip went off a while ago, and I apologize. But um, it's about a relationship with God. That's the ultimate relationship that we can have. And that relationship is through Christ Jesus. Don't have time to get to the Thessalonians lesson, but I think that last two verses is an apt... Uh, an apt send-off, don't you? Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them 
in every good work and word. I pray that blessing for you all as we minister in our families, in our marriages, in our workplaces, in the community in general. I pray that power and the peace of a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. I pray that for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a moment to meditate on the word and the will of God.